Thanksgiving Eve, as I would say, mm -hmm. and so we should not have class, okay, but we planned on this, we've got plenty of time to finish out respiratory, plenty of time to finish out uh, cardiovascular, so that is our schedule, and then I want to draw your attention to December 10th, December 10th, according to the final exam schedule, in this room, which is a Tuesday, from 3 to 5 p.m., I think I've mentioned this before, the good news is if you come to class on Monday, you'll be the, likely the only one here. Or you'll be here with people that you don't recognize because you're in the wrong final, okay? So don't take that final and excuse yourself, look at the syllabus and realize, oh, I'm a day early. And then the good news is you have a whole extra day to stay, okay? So Tuesday, December 10th is the final for three to five in this room. You'll have plenty of time. I mean, we, we usually have an hour and 15 minutes, so um, most of you are done in that period of time. Any questions about the schedule? Uh, just quick, I, on the final, can you, if, if, if you have somebody give a percentage on like new material versus old, is it like 80 20 ish? Yeah, it'll probably be pretty close to 80 20. That's a good number. Everybody like that number? <laughs> no, that is the number, okay? Probably about 20%. So, Maybe five to 10 questions. That would be 10 to 20% review. Five to 10 questions will be review content, okay? Average, maybe seven and a half. I can't really do the half a question, so there you go. Any other questions or comments? Okay. Respiratory diseases. So we're gonna look at um, a couple of different categories. And then we're gonna hone in today mostly on, on vaping because it's relevant in today's culture. But to give you more of a comprehensive view to start, we'll talk about adolescent which is basically lung collapse. And then we'll talk about obstructive pulmonary diseases and then restrictive pulmonary diseases. And then lastly, on Wednesday, we'll talk about uh, infections. Now, uh, what's interesting is if you read some of the vaping literature, and I've actually posted a peer-reviewed manuscript from 2019, uh, that actually has histology. So when, when we have lung histology, what does that typically tell you about the patient situation? So they're either deceased or it's pretty severe because they've actually had to biopsy lung tissue. If you can do a, you can do a, a, a 
minimally invasive lung biopsy to see what things are and not you know, have to you know, sacrifice the patient. Sorry, Mr. Johnson, we're gonna have to sacrifice your life to get a lung biopsy. Um, and they don't have to have that awkward conversation, right? So, but it means it's pretty serious if you're taking lung biopsies. We usually don't do lung biopsies until we're talking about cancer. And now we're talking about vaping and actually <coughs> in teenage patients, in children. I'll show you one example today of a 17 year old, which I think by law is considered a boy, even though he probably would hate me for calling him a boy. He's only 17, he's not quite an adult yet, okay? So, we'll talk about all these different categories and, um, and we'll look at some of the histology and we, we don't have time to cover everything, but we'll be somewhat comprehensive and where we're gonna go deeper is into uh, vaping because I thought that would be an interesting topic for us. So, let's do some review. Let's look at some of these, these terminologies. Like you guys know that I enjoy making sure that we're all on the same page at some level. Um, so, eupnea, dyspnea, and orthopenia. So, eupnea, this is a word from a Greek root. EU or U meaning well, and um, noia, or with the P, P N O I A, is from the Greek meaning breath. You don't pronounce the P, it's silent. So, noia, uh, this would be well breathing, eupnea or eunoia in the Greek, well breathing. That's normal breathing. So eupnea is normal breathing. Sounds like a disease, but it's not, okay? So don't be tricked by that. Dyspnea, what do you think this is? This is troubled breathing, or what we would call a shortness of breath, abbreviated SOB, right? Bless you. I remember, this is a funny story. I remember the first time I saw the, the uh, Acronym SOB. I was uh, I was volunteering in a, in a hospital ER setting back when they called it the emergency room and they called it the emergency department. And I remember seeing on the whiteboard, you know, um, SOB, SOB, you know, in, in, in these different rooms, like four of them. And um, and then I heard one of the nurses walk by. In room four, there's a really really difficult SOB. And I'm like, wow, I'm not sure this whole medical field. <laughs> they're really harsh on what they're calling these patients. It stands for shortness of breath. It's actually not that they're, you know, uh, defaming the patient, all right, in, in any way. So SOB, shortness of breath. Arthropenia. This is shortness of breath while you are lying down, okay, in a horizontal position. So you can imagine if patients have shortness of breath when they're laying down, it's more severe than if they're, you know, having shortness of breath when they're climbing the stairs. All right, hyperventilation versus hypoventilation. Please define those for me. These are just straight definitions, but if you don't know these things clinically when you get into the readings, you're gonna have problems. Hyper versus hypo. Hyperventilation. Too much, I'm not sure. Too much, thank you, wow. You guys are shy today for some reason, okay. Um, hypoventilation. Okay, too little, under breathing. Hypercapnia versus hypocapnia. What is the word capnia referring to? CO2 levels, okay? So hypercapnic is high CO2 in the blood. Usually they're in a state of um, acidosis. And then um, hypocapnic is low CO2, low CO2. We typically through the bicarbonate buffer system, you guys remember that in 202? In the bicarbonate buffer system, we exhale off a lot of our acid load, right? So uh, free acid moves into the bloodstream, right? And it's conjugated through this bicarbonate buffer system. And now you breathe off CO2 and water vapor, right? So that's how you clean your glasses, like, right? That's where the water vapor comes from because of metabolic uh, exhalation. So if you're exercising, the reason that your um, ventilation rate goes up isn't just to supply you with more oxygen, it's actually to help breathe off extra acid. It's one of the reasons when you're done running, you don't automatically move back to regular respiration because there's an acid load that's still trying to get out of your body and so your, your respiration stay a little elevated, right? This is all exercise science stuff stay a little elevated even beyond the ceasing of, of physical exertion. Make sense? All right, uh, 
hemoptysis. Hemoptysis. This is blood in uh, sputum or coughing up blood. Cyanosis. This is a bluish color to the skin or the mucosa, which usually is an indication that there's a decrease of oxygenation in the bloodstream or hemoglobin is deoxygenated. Hypoxemia, hypoxemia, decreased oxygenation of arterial blood, and then hypoxia is a decreased oxygenation at the tissue level or at the cellular level. So hypoxemia is in the blood itself arterial blood specifically, and hypoxia is at the level of the tissues. And this is straight out of um, an anatomy physiology test. This is 202, second semester respiratory physiology. And there's just a couple of things I wanna highlight. I wanna highlight this tidal volume, which is about half a liter. So tidal volume is that amount of air that you move at rest while you're sitting here. You're not exercising, okay? You're not under exertion. You move about half a liter of air in and out. And if you do a big inhalation, right? You go, you go through a big inhalation, then your inspiratory reserve volume right here is what you cut into. If you go through a big expiration, your expiratory reserve volume is what you cut into. And then if you remember, there's a residual volume that you can never exhale completely, right? It's a little over a liter, about 1.2 liters. And the purpose of this residual volume is to make sure that your alveoli stay inflated. So it's as if you took all the air out of the balloon and you lay it on the table, Right? It's not completely flat, it still doesn't have the shape to it because it has sort of an elasticity. And your alveoli and your respiratory tree is very similar. It is elastic, it has elastin in it. We'll talk about elastin. And there's enzymes known as elastase that break down that elastin and it makes the lungs less elastomeric. Right? And we'll see that in disease states. So that reserve volume that you cut into when you exhale, expiratory reserve volume, does not cut into the residual volume ever. That just keeps your lungs inflated, okay? You guys remember all this? Total lung capacity in a average size individual is about six liters. But you're only gonna be moving maybe 4.8 of it because of that residual volume. Make sense? So we've got diseases that can impact us when we inhale or make it difficult to inhale, and we have diseases that impact us or make it difficult when we, when we exhale. We're gonna look at both. And I just want you to remember on this graph from respiratory phys, where exactly we're talking about. All right, first off, let's talk about a lung collapse. <clears throat> this one's kind of cool because a lot of you like emergency medicine, and so you'll get collapsed lungs that you'll deal with. Not cool for the patient, but cool in the clinical standpoint. Right? So lung collapse, Atelectasis is the formal term for that. And it's due to an inadequate amount of expansion, which causes ultimately a reduction in um, oxygenation. So oxygenation at the level of the arterial system, arterial blood, would be hypoxemia. And eventually that leads to hypoxia at the level of the tissues. Three different types. We got resorption, compression, and then we've got contraction. So if we look at resorption, this is atelectasis where we've got a obstruction that's preventing air from reaching the distal airways. And you can see kind of on that <coughs> left image here, we've got some obstruction that is a resorptive type of atelectasis and you get this lung collapse where it's not able to completely expand to its full capacity. The, um, the air that's present becomes absorbed in the <coughs> distal portion of that airway, and then you get alveolar collapse. Alveolar collapse, meaning remember those balloons that I'm talking about, 
where you get gas exchange, they actually completely deflate and you have membrane touching membrane. There's no gap in between. Compression type of atelectasis, uh, you can see on the far right image. Usually the compression is due to some type of infusion um, of fluid or an infusion of air. So in effusions that come from chronic heart failure, that's what the CHF is, and then we're gonna talk about that next week. Maybe we won't get to it next week, but we'll talk about it in the cardiovascular section. So when the heart is compromised and you have a large pressure head that the heart is working against, meaning that mean arterial pressure is high or blood pressure is high, the heart has to work against the pressure head to get it out of the aortic blood. And so it's inefficient, you get a lot of backup. And a lot of the backup of blood or fluid ingestion goes to the lungs because that's where the, the blood flow came from to get oxygenated. So now you have a pressure head in the lungs and now you're actually getting a lot of extra fluid that sits on top of the lungs. And that can cause a compression type of atelectasis around the um, lungs themselves in the pleural space, which is why we refer to chronic heart failure we also refer to it as congestive heart failure because there's a lot of congestion. In fact, if you talk to a lot of heart failure patients that are in end stage heart failure, they'll tell you it's hard to breathe. It feels like somebody's sitting on my chest. And it's because of this situation where they've got a bunch of fluid that they're trying to inhale and expand the airway against. If you guys know anything about hydraulic brakes, the reason you have fluid in your brake lines is because fluid is not very compressible, okay? So if it's not very compressible, are you going to win when you're trying to inhale and push against a volume of liquid that's there? No. So compression, uh, atelectasis. The second situation can happen where it's not fluid, it's actually air. And believe it or not, it's not quite as dangerous. You're like, really? Well, because air is actually more compressible than fluid. But it's still the same situation. So in a pneumothorax is where you would actually have, usually it's trauma, and so the chest cavity is compromised, and now the air pressure from the atmospheric air is the same as it is in that pleural space, and now you're working against this pressure head, and you've got air sitting in this space from the air that rushes in, right? If you guys remember back to respiratory fist, around the lungs, it's slightly negative pressure slight negative pressure to allow for the lungs to expand and air to rush in. Because flow is from P, the difference between P1 and P2. That's what equals, that's the equation for flow. So if you have pressure that's higher here and pressure that's lower here, air is gonna flow from high to low pressure. Make sense? So pneumothorax, you, do, you lose that pressure gradient and now you're pushing against the atmospheric air and you don't have the slight negative pressure to work in your advantage, so you have a lung collapse. And then the last one is considered contraction atelectasis. And in contraction atelectasis, this is where the lung itself goes through fibrotic changes. Um, it becomes scarred. And the scarring of the lung prevents it from having its elastomeric recoil. And so you get, you got this contraction event that takes place essentially globally, and now the lung is actually shrunk down. So three different causes of atelectasis. So let's look at um, chronic obstructive pulmonary <coughs> diseases first. Chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. So obstructive pulmonary diseases. So these diseases, <coughs> which are gonna include emphysema and chronic bronchitis, these are worse than expiration. Obstructive pulmonary diseases by definition are worse with expiration. It doesn't mean that you don't feel bad on inspiration, but the symptoms are exaggerated on exhalation or expiration, okay? So the two by definition on this list that are considered obstructive are emphysema and chronic bronchitis. We'll look down later um, at uh, asthma and bronchiectasis as obstructive diseases, but they're not necessarily considered 
chronic typically because they don't necessarily last for, for you know all the time. Usually there are symptoms with that with, with an asthmatic, and then you treat, and then it goes away. Make sense? You, you use the inhaler. There's rescue medications, or in some cases with asthmatics, they're on daily medication uh, to prevent the airways from becoming inflamed or irritated. So emphysema and chronic bronchitis, these two by definition stick around forever, forever, okay? There's really no cure. And so we refer to these as COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary diseases. All right, so let's look first at emphysema, bless you. And you know, in, in this portion of the lecture, we're here to talk about emphysema and we'll compare it and contrast it to chronic bronchitis. And, and then we are gonna move in for the rest of today into uh, vaping or e-cigarettes and vaping. Because I have a lot of new information on that topic, which is, it, it's really actually quite popular in the medical news right now. It's pretty crazy. Um, and so I think it's, it's current. Um, there's a lot of new information since when I looked at it last. So that's where we're gonna end today's lecture. But so emphysema, chronic bronchitis, we'll compare and contrast the two and then we'll wrap up today with, with vaping information. Um, and there's a little bit of homework for you guys uh, to, to do. There's a, there's a manuscript that I uploaded uh, into uh, this week's session, and we'll talk a little bit about that paper, but I do want you guys to take a look at it. End of the semester, challenging and pushing you a little bit more, um, never a bad thing, but I wanna give you guys an example of how you can go into the peer reviewed literature and learn about some of these things with some of the knowledge that all right, so <clears throat> emphysema. Emphysema primarily affects the asinus, okay? And there's a loss of surface area and you get a blowout of the alveoli. So when we say a blowout, meaning an increase in surface area, that's not a good thing. It's not an increase in surface area so you have better gas exchange. It's an increase in the surface area because you've lost the architecture of the alveoli. So let me give you an example. So if we look at, at, at kind of a typical alveoli, right, kind of looks like this. Looks like a little cloud. So in emphysema, what we would see is this thing would kind of, it would sort of do one of these. Okay, so you increase the surface area, but you lose the structure. So you have kind of these big pockets now versus these nice, neat little tufts. And now gas exchange is actually compromised and the ability of the alveolus to facilitate gas exchange is compromised. <coughs> so we get alveolar enlargement that's distal to the termi terminal bronchi or bronchioles, excuse me, um, which is basically where the asinus is. That's the uh, respiratory zone, right? So in the respiratory zone, we have the respiratory bronchioles down to um, all the way to the alveolus. So we've got respiratory bronchioles down to the alveolar duct and including the alveolus, which is known as the asinus, right? So here's a normal asinus, right? Here we've got our respiratory bronchioles, We've got our alveolar ducts, and we've got an individual alveoli. Um, you can kind of appreciate two different situations here. The most common is the centra a center. So it's in the middle of the respiratory bronchial where you get this blowout that occurs. Para a center emphysema is at the end where you get this blowout that takes place. This is all due to an a loss of elastic recoil. And the reason for the a loss of elastic recoil is because you lower elastin content in the lung tissue. And we'll talk about how this happens here in a second. So cigarette smoking is more common in center, as a center of a center. Um, and it's mostly seen in the upper lung lobes, not the lower. And the para center, which is less common with cigarette use, it's more common in lower lung location, and is typically found in patients that wrestle with what's called an anti-trypsin disease. 
So we'll talk about that in a second. It actually has a lot to do with elastin breakdown. This histology picture up top. So what I want you to appreciate from this, and we'll look at some more hist lung histology throughout today. Um, so this is where this respiratory bronchial is coming in. It's coming down like this. There's another branch that goes down like this, uh, down a alveolar duct and into an alveolus. And this second part of this alveolus is blown out right here. You guys see this? Um, same thing over here is this, this is a, is a great uh, shape, but this one is the alveolar duct. And here is where this alveolus is actually blown out and off the screen. This one you can see in the entire um, frame of the screen. This, this, is an, this white space is an alveolus, but it shouldn't be this large. It, you know, it's kind of looking like one of these right here. Is there a hand or a question? Sorry, Panna Center. Okay. Panna Center. Yeah, thank you. But I, I, sorry if I misspoke. So, Centra Center and Panna. Pan, Panna Center. Panna Center. Would yeah. the histology be Panna Center? This histology would be Panna Center because it's at the end. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. So, let's talk about emphysema and how it gets going. Um, it's not super clear what leads to it. Um, it's also not correct to assume that everybody, every patient that's wrestling with emphysema was a smoker. Okay, that's an important piece for you guys to understand. And so like I characterized on this previous slide um, with uh, pan a center, there's a underlying um, genetic predisposition for this that may have nothing to do with cigarette smoking. Now, if those patients smoke on top of it, it could be like a double whammy. But there's two main things going on in patients that we're aware of, okay? One is a protease, anti-protease imbalance. And what I mean by that is <clears throat> there are typical um, enzymes that will be released within the lung tissue. So if you look here, you've got, um, capillaries that recruit neutrophils into an area. You've got neutrophil um, elastase that gets released, okay? And this alpha-1 antitrypsinase blocks the activity of neutrophil elastase. So this is alpha-1 antitrypsinase. So this alpha trypsinase um, that is present in lung tissue helps to neutralize this elastase that's being released by uh, lung macrophages. Why would you do that? Well, remember the lungs are in direct interface with the outside environment. So you're gonna get a lot of foreign invaders. So there's a lot of lung macrophages that are available, okay? Now they're typically not in an activated state and they're not proliferating. And so you don't want to be oversensitized to a foreign object and release copious amounts of elastase and degrade your tissue to a point where now it completely remodels. And so you've got a balancing act here of an antiprotease or a protease inhibitor. Now there are certain patients that have a deficiency in that gene. And so these patients that have a congenital mutation or a deficiency in this alpha-1 antitrypsinase don't have the ability nicely balance the elastase that's made by lung macrophages. And so they have a predisposition for developing emphysema because of the elastase ability to remodel tissue. Does that make sense? So that's one thing that we know. Can you test for it? Sure. Do you want to know that information? I'm not, I don't know the answer to that. Okay. I, I frankly probably wouldn't want to know the answer to that. Okay. Um, the other situation is this oxidant, antioxidant imbalance. So what I mean by that is we know that cigarette smoke, tobacco, we also know that um, other types of pollutants kind of lead into 
uh, vaping. Things that are in the air or the mist that we're breathing will contain free radicals. And those free radicals have a similar type of activity where they deactivate the normal activity of the antitrypsinase. Okay? So these free radicals will inactivate the antitrypsinase, and now you've got this reactive oxygen species pathway that's operating very similar to this congenital defect. So that's the second thing that we know. The third thing that we know, which should be on here, but I mean, it's kind of we're alluding to it, is that the tobacco itself, um, nicotine, as well as the free radicals, they stimulate through interleukin-8 and TNF-alpha the recruitment of additional neutrophils or monocytes becoming macrophages into the, into the lung tissue. And so they're aiding in the ability of these macrophages to come in here and increase elastase production. And oh, by the way, it's not just elastase. There's other matrix metalloproteinases that remodel extracellular matrix that are being produced by these resident alveolar macrophages that come in as they're being recruited out of the bloodstream. Just like you guys saw when we roll and tether in inflammation, this is an inflammatory response that's happening at the lungs. Does that make sense? So three things that we're talking about. One is there's a patient population that's genetically predispos predisposed to this. They've got some sort of deficiency in alpha-1 AT. Then we've got population of patients that smoke. And smoking has multiple things that are problematic. Number one is the reactive oxygen species mimic this congenital defect, and they inactivate the alpha-1 antitrypsinase. And number two is they stimulate through the recruitment of additional uh, white blood cells more alveolar macrophages to show up and remodel that tissue in a negative way. You guys with me? So these patients um, of an emphysema etiology or clinical uh, sequela, they have shortness of breath or dyspnea. We refer to them as, as pink puffers in the literature. You'll see a lot of terminology on pink puffers. And the reason is that, because of that, is there's a lot of extra energy associated with trying to exhale, okay? They're often barrel chested, and they lose a lot of weight over time, so they tend to be thinner because they're spending a lot of energy burning calories trying to, trying to breathe. Okay, so I want all of you to do a, an activity with me, okay? You're gonna take a deep inhalation, okay? You're gonna breathe out halfway, and then I want you to breathe from that tidal volume from then on out, ready? So deep inhalation, exhale, halfway. <coughs> Feel that? Don't you just wanna have a big exhale? That's how they're breathing. They're breathing at the very upper end of that. Now you're all like, I'm gonna pass out. I'm like, I'm gonna okay. And don't do it very long. So that's how they're breathing for years, and that's why they lose so much weight. And that's why there's a lot of exertion on exhalation, and that's why they become sort of pink in coloration. Okay, I wanna contrast this with chronic bronchitis. I wanna contrast this with chronic bronchitis. So if we look at um, emphysema on the, on the right, and we're saying, again, because we're in a classroom, we can have ideological thinking. We can say that there is a theoretical patient that is only wrestling with emphysema, and this is what it's gonna look like, right? We've got these blown out alveoli, and we're gonna now look at pure chronic bronchitis. Now we can, unless you isolate this out into large airways as well as small airways. Now, what's the reality? Do patients only have one and never the other? No, of course not. You guys probably know by now that it's never that black and white. But for purposes of our class, we're gonna segregate them out and say, oh, it, it, it only is going to be this or it's only gonna be this. So if I have a question on the exam, 
the, the spirit of the question is, tell me, ideologically, pure emphysema has the following. Ideologically, pure bronchitis has the following. I know you're gonna get, I'm gonna get emails from you in the future like, yeah, you're right, Dr. Keller, it's never as easy as it was in your class because we've got patients that have all sorts of mixed clinical problems, okay? And we're trying to sort out what's going on, and they got like five things happening. On top of that, they're alcoholics or whatever, you know. <laughs> okay, so, compared to emphysema, chronic bronchitis means that they have a persistent cough. Persistent cough um, that is um, productive. 90% of them tend to be smokers, but not all chronic bronchitis sufferers are smokers. So we've got three different types, simple, chronic asthmatic, and chronic obstructive. In simple chronic bronchitis, we've got mucus is present, so it's a productive cough and they're spitting up sputum, right? They're making loogies. Right? So it's a mucus is present, but the airflow is not obstructed. <coughs> Chronic asthmatic, there's intermittent bronchiospasm in addition to the mucus. Right? So now in this bron bron chronic bronchitis patient, they actually have bronchiospasm where the bronchioles are restricting down. And then chronic obstructive is the worst type the most severe, where you would actually have mucus so thick that it's blocking the respiratory tree, and really it's only seen in smokers for the most part, chronic obstructive. So, can you develop bronchitis as a diagnosed lung disease, as a non-smoking, <coughs> healthy, College age student? Yeah, of course. You know, they're gonna, you know, hey, you've got some sort of lung infection, you're developing mucus, but it's productive, it's green, we're gonna put you on antibiotics because you have bronchitis. That is very different than a smoker who's been smoking a pack a day for 40 years, and they've had the same cough for 40 years. Do you understand? I always get those questions like, well, I don't understand. I, I had bronchitis last winter, Dr. Keller. See, yeah, you did. You did. But we're talking about simple bronchitis, right? So it was probably still difficult to breathe, right, if you had bronchitis. But we're, we're, we're talking about very different levels of bronchitis. You guys with me? Okay, so some students get caught up on that. Like, well, I had bronchitis. It wasn't that bad. I mean, I had some medication, and I got over it in like two weeks. Okay, well, that, that's up here. That's simple. Simple bronchitis, okay. Um, if we look at the different airways, um, we'll see that the small airways, like the bronchioles, we get fibrosis that takes place around the bronchioles. We get airway obstruction, like, and, and this is in the situations most observed in chronic obstructive, where we've got uh, airway obstruction at the um, distal airways. In large airways, like the trachea and the bronchi, we'll get hypersecretion of mucus, we'll get rampant inflammation here, okay? And again, this is our chronic bronchitis, mostly in the chronic obstructive phase. So it impacts the large airways and the small airways in slightly different ways. Um, the diagnose bronchitis is usually there's a per, per, uh, persistent cough for at least three consecutive months in at least two consecutive years. So arguably, even with simple bronchitis diagnoses, we're diagnosed, you're, you're being diagnosed a little prematurely. Because really there needs to be a persistent cough for three months. And I, I know I know people are getting diagnosed with bronchitis, and I'm not arguing they've got something bad going on with their lungs. But you know, it's like I've had bronchitis for two weeks. Well, technically, bronchitis is something that lasts for a couple of months. Okay. All right, so in this disease, similar to what we talked about with emphysema, we've got a loss of pseudostratified epithelium. A loss of pseudostratified epithelium. So your respiratory escalator is compromised. 
And, and this doesn't happen in a couple weeks. This usually takes a few months for this to take place. But again, we're talking about um, the chronic <coughs> obstructive type, the most severe. Okay? Um, there's thoughts of an environmental trigger, meaning that there might be something that's happening within the air that we breathe, whether it's air pollution or whether it's you know, cigarette smoke or baking fumes, we don't know. Um, that's going to upregulate the production of mucus uh, by turning on the mucin gene. So now you get hypertrophy of submucosal glands, and this tends to begin in the large airways first, and then it moves to the smaller airways. And oftentimes, when you get extra mucus that's there and it's sitting there, you get an infection. The infection follows the sitting of mucus. So. In, in patients that are asthmatics, um, if they get a chest cold, oftentimes it'll result in some sort of lung infection. And part of the reason is with asthmatics, they get a lot of congestion in the chest. And if they can't get the, the, the phlegm out and it gets stuck down there, it turns into a chest infection. Okay. So in these patients, um, Here's the, uh, this is normal. This is normal epithelium up here. The pseudostratified um, columnar ciliated epithelium. And this is a goblet cell right here that's dumping out mucus. Uh, and this is pathological histology where you can see all of this area with all of these purple nuclei. These are all inflammatory cells that are sitting within mucus, okay? In the lung tissue, in the alveolar spaces. These patients with, them, um, with clinical features of um, chronic bronchitis are usually referred to as blue bloaters. It's very difficult to find patients clinically that are wrestling with chronic bronchitis that were smokers that don't have emphysema. And so that's why the slide says with emphysema. That's most typical, is you get a patient that has chronic obstructive bronchitis and emphysema that present simultaneously. Okay. If the emphysema wins out, they tend to be thinner. If the chronic bronchitis is uh, winning out, they tend to be more blue in coloration. And the reason for the blue, why, is, why, why do you guys think they're blue? Hypoxemia. What's that? Hypoxemia. Yeah, they're, they're under oxygenated. Okay, they're not able to get enough oxygen. So the skin is blue in color, they have shortness of breath, um, they retain their CO2, um, they're hypoxic and cyanotic. <clears throat> they tend to be a little bit overweight. One of the thought processes on why is because metabolism is low. So basically if they're starving for oxygen, their metabolism isn't able to give them the energy and so they sort of just kind of lack of energy, sit and not do a whole lot, okay? They have a lot of shortness of breath, so they're not gonna be exercising because that's hard to do. Um, they have cough with sputum, so it's a productive cough like we were talking about, and they have shortness of breath on exertion. Okay, third category for today, um, <coughs> E-cigarettes and vaping. So it's amazing. I spent some time over the weekend updating the slides. It's it been, it, it been five years since I've looked at this topic. Okay? It's been five years since I've looked at the topic. And over the five years, it, the, the field was very busy with a lot of accusations. But now we're starting to see some much more definitive decisions that are being made. And so I want to share with you some of these decisions. So this is a previous slide. It's probably the slide that you have, but mine's slightly updated because I used to say, are they safe, not clear. Now I've crossed it out that they are not safe. And I'll show you why. Uh, it shouldn't be a surprise. But the way these things work, in case some of you don't know, is they have a heater. You know, usually it's battery operated. They have a heater. It heats some sort of liquid that contains an active ingredient. 
And when I made this slide, really the only thing that people were vaping was nicotine. Now there's all sorts of things. You can vape with, with THC or CPD, uh, which are some of the active components in marijuana. Um, and obviously <coughs> nicotine. Um, you can vape um, without any active ingredient other than a flavor if you want. Okay. Um, usually there's a vapor that you see and that can be inhaled. The manufacturers have always claimed that they're a safe alternative to smoking with no data to substantiate. The FDA has always questioned the safety on these products. And in early years, they tested the samples um, and found that they do contain trace amounts of toxic chemicals and carcinogens. Because a lot of thinking was, well, there's no carcinogens, not like burning a cigarette. There are definitely fewer carcinogenic agents. So cancer may not be a problem, may not be a problem with e-cigarettes and vaping. It might be that you won't live long enough to develop cancer. So I'll explain to you here in a minute what's going on, okay? So this is kind of where things have sat for a while. Um, I wanna show you, I didn't make this a slide because it's pretty cheesy, but um, this is from uh, a USA Today. I was traveling and, and I was years ago, you can see the date up here, April 18th, 2014. So it, it's almost six years old, right? April in the spring, would, this, this article would be six years old. And so six, almost six years ago, I pulled this and we got opposing views in our view, and I'll, I'll post this so you guys can read it. We're not gonna spend all the time here, but so the, the pro our products can help end smoking over here on the right. Combustion tobacco cigarettes will prematurely kill almost half a million Americans this year. This devastating trend is projected to continue for years but is not inevitable, right? Uh, E-cigarettes deliver, second paragraph, deliver nicotine without combustion and can help end smoking. So this is the position over here, okay? It's almost like a debate, okay? And one of the uh, manufacturers, one of the early manufacturers called Enjoy. And then over here, e-cigarette sellers uh, take a page from Big Tobacco. So over here, this is opening up, which is the other view of, the, of this, the manufacturers talking about how dangerous this potentially could be. Right, down at the middle a column at the very end, the dangers of e-cigarettes may not be as obvious as those of traditional smokes, but new problems are emerging. This is almost six years ago. For example, the nicotine-laced liquid the device is used, which comes in small vials and large containers, can be toxic um, uh, if touched or consumed. Calls to poison control centers about misuse, mostly by children, have risen to 217 a month this year, almost 10 times the number in 2011. So like 217, is that a big deal? Well, wait, the numbers get worse. We're gonna talk about numbers. So this was back in 14, and I saved this article, and I just wanted to show it to you because We've been having this debate for half of a decade, for sure, five years, okay? All right, so now let's go to where we are today. All right, so <coughs> now we're gonna go to another article. This is on the website of the Center for Disease Control, okay? This is a great resource for you guys to read. Um, Outbreak of lung injury associated with the use of e-cigarette or vaping products. So now there's actually an acronym for this. It's called EVALI, E-V-A-L-I, right? Effect, right, e-cigarette, e-cigarette vaping associated lung injury, E-V-A-L-I. It's got its own acronym. Center for Disease Control, this website, you can read all this, this is updated. Um, on November 14th, that's that's today, right? Oh no, this is actually the last week, sorry. November 14th, that was today. Um, so CDC has identified that vitamin E acetate is a chemical concern, right, associated with this lung injury. I'm gonna show you what this lung injury is. Now vitamin E, vitamin E is well used, right? You find it in lotions, you find you can go buy vitamins and, and, and swallow a pill of vitamin E. But the problem is, as a cutting agent in vaping, what that means is when they, when they pharmaceutically manufacture these solutions, a cutting agent is used 
to lower the amount of the active substance that needs to go in. So you still have substance to, to bake, but it's not 100% nicotine or 100% um, THC, one of the active ingredients in marijuana. And so they use vitamin E, but it's never been tested as an inhalant. And this one is actually causing remarkable problems, okay? All right, so let's keep reading. Uh, okay, I've got these numbers here. So this is the website, this is where all my information came from. And um, I wanna go to this particular slide. This is the Washington Post. This particular slide you can see November 12th, this is just last week. So this data is only a week old. Uh, doctors in Michigan said Tuesday to perform what they believe is the first double lung transplant on a patient whose lungs were damaged from baby, highlighting the extreme <coughs> steps medical experts are taking as they confront a nationwide rash of vaping related illness. The medical team from Detroit's Henry Ford Hospital said the patient, a 17-year-old male, underwent the roughly six-hour transplant surgery October 15th. He spent a month on life support machines after suffering complete lung failure at 17 years of age, okay? And would have faced certain death without the operation, according to doctors. The team's family described him as an athlete who was in perfect health before he was admitted to the hospital in early September which, with what appeared to be pneumonia. Within weeks, his condition had been so dire he shot to the top of the national transplant list where most patients spend months waiting for a doctor. Probably because he was 17 and he was in good health. Um, so the only thing that was wrong with him were his lungs, okay? So that's good news. All right, so I want to show you this particular video. Let's see if my audio will play. On the 15th of October, our team, the lung transplant team, performed what we believe is the first double lung transplant done in the nation for a vaping injury victim who's a teenager. Essentially, the reason we wanted to bring, bring this case to public attention because of the epidemic of um, of e-cigarettes and vaping induced lung injury that we are witnessing in the country. As of last Valley, week, that's um, it's over 2,000 cases were reported to CDC. Close to 40 deaths were confirmed from lung failure related to this injury. Um, it's um, a senseless disease process, uh, totally preventable death. And our teenage patient would have faced certain death if it weren't for the uh, lung transplant um, happened. The picture of the lung after transplantation on the left side, and um, the picture of the, our recipient's lung before when we first transferred him down here, uh, showing the destruction that occurred to his native lung, the amount of pneumonia that was there. And the okay, so I'm gonna show you some other pictures because it's not super clear from another article on Evali, okay? Um, this is going to go into a cat, like, on a treadmill here in a second, which is really um, distracting. So we're just going to go back, gonna go back to, uh, to the, regular, the regular presentation. But, I mean, basically you said what I said, but I wanted you guys to hear it from the, the surgeon. Um, you can read this for yourself. You can look at the whole thing. I encourage you to dive into the CDC website. Um, on the CDC website, there's actually a button. Let me show you that link. There's a button here that says, where is it? Latest outbreak information is updated every Thursday. So the information I have is from last Thursday. So this Thursday and then on Thanksgiving, you can go and just click the button and see how many more people have died. It'll be quite interesting, okay? I know, I meant that very facetiously, I know. Um, okay, so. This is from the CDC as of last Thursday. Uh, you can take a peek. This is this is more on that. All of these slides came off of that website, the Center for Disease Control. Okay, uh, you can see the number of cases. Uh, we've got you know 150 to 200 cases, or just shy 199 in these country or these countries, these states that are highlighted in green. Uh, Arizona's not looking too hot. Well, I guess it's not too bad, is it? Is it like 10 to 49? Doesn't look too bad. Uh, Utah, I was surprised by Utah. Uh, Utah being high, I thought Colorado would be higher than Utah, but you know, shows, shows what I know. Uh, so this kind of shows you um, where everything is taking place. Now I wanna highlight this paper. I put this paper in the uh, BD Learn folder. 
this afternoon so you guys can read through the whole thing on your own. So this is lung biopsy findings in severe pulmonary illness associated with e-cigarette use, vaping. Uh, you can see the list of physicians that are shown here. Uh, this is from the Cleveland Clinic, a very well respected facility, the Department of Pathology, uh, probably know what they're talking about. Um, keywords, vaping, vaping associated pulmonary illness, electronic cigarettes, e-cigarettes, dabbing, is that, is that a thing, dabbing, is that a Ah, yeah, I got you. All right, see, I'm learning. Lung pathology, lung biopsy, diffuse alveolar damage. Diffuse alveolar damage, we're not going to talk about today. We're going to talk about it on Wednesday. Diffuse alveolar da damage, DAD, not the great kind of dad. It's a different kind of dad, okay? Uh, organizing pneumonia, acute lung injury. So the objective, the aim of this report is to describe the lung biopsy findings and vaping-associated pulmonary illness. So, folks, this is a disease that we did not know about when I showed you that USA Today paper with Jenny McCarthy like five and a half years ago. This disease we just invented in the last five and a half years. Amazing, okay? So are there gonna be new diseases that you all are facing in the future? Absolutely, okay? Stuff that we didn't even know existed because we're gonna come up with new technology and new things and there's gonna be new risks Use some common sense, okay? I was very skeptical about vaping, and I would tell students, and I'd say, well, what do you think? You think it's good for you, you think it's bad for you? I don't know, there's not enough data. I mean, we've, it's like brand new. I, I mean, I said, I said, in 10 years, we'll see. My suspicion has always been, if you can see the air you breathe, probably not something you should be breathing, okay? Are most of them THC related? No, not all of them. Um, mo most of them are related with vitamin E acetate. Um, and there's been incidents associated with vaping that do not vitamin E. These are the ones that are most severe, um, where you know, you're know you atomizing or you're basically vaping fluid and it's becoming uh, airborne and there's particulates in it. Um, but the problem with the vitamin E acetate is it does a lot of uh, lung damage. Um, it, it basically sticks to the lung because it's a sticky substance, and it's hard to get out. Um, and so your lung isn't designed for removing kind of like that goopy um, vitamin E. If you've ever had a vitamin E gel, have you guys ever, you know, or taken a vitamin E caplet and, and open it up? It, it's like gooey, okay? Right, you're like, you do, yeah, I mean, I, that was me as a kid. Oh, let's cut it open. Let's see what it looks like on the inside. All right, so here's, um, uh, CT images from this paper, so you can read through these CT images from this paper. Uh, this is a patient that, a uh, different patient than what we were talking about on the video. This is a totally different paper, okay? But this one was published in 2019. You can actually see here at the bottom, uh, this is almost a preprint, because it doesn't even have page numbers. This is American Journal of Clinical Pathology in 2019, so this is literally fresh off the press. Uh, so what we're doing is we're going on CT imagery, patients laying down, and you're going from toe to head or head to toe. And so we're basically looking here. So it's as if I'm laying on the table with my feet facing you, and you're looking at a slice right through my lungs. Does that make sense? Okay. So what we've got here is the patient's left is going to be on your right, and the patient's right is going to be on your left. You guys with me? And all of this white sort of shadow shouldn't be there. And as we go deeper down, you can see there's more exaggerated white shadow. And so what we've got is we call these opacities within the CT imagery. And this is showing areas, this is what pneumonia looks like. If you have pneumonia on a chest x-ray even, you'll see a bunch of white where it's supposed to be black. So what is it supposed to look like? Here's a normal lung CT. And here is this image, level B, I picked this one, compare and contrast an eval-I lung under CT. These are data we did not have five and a half years ago. This is data that was just published this year, 2019. It's so new, it doesn't even actually have a, a DOI number yet. It's available, you can download the PDF and I gave it to you. But this is real stuff, folks. Hey, okay, happening right now today, real time. 
Okay, um, last uh, piece of histology, or information, actually. Let's look at this one histology. From the same paper. And there's more histology, for those of you that after uh, a turkey dinner, you want to spend a little bit more time looking at histo. Um, so on, on this histology, same kind of thing. Uh, we've got alveoli, let's say this one for example. Um, this alveoli is supposed, to, this is supposed to be white in here. And what are those cells? What do you guys think those cells are? So they were, they're, they're neutrophils, that's fine. That's, that's an okay answer. Uh, it's, it's late. It's, uh, don't tell anybody it's in the figure book in the answer. Macrophages. Macrophages, very good. They're called foamy macrophages. What are foamy macrophages? Well, the foamy macrophages means that they've taken up debris, right? They're cleaning up debris. They're cleaning up particulates come out of the, the, uh, the vapor, uh, maybe some carcinogenic agents. Um, there were glycol-like substances that are typically used in vaping products for nicotine. So there could be some, some glycol-based products that they're gobbling up. Uh, or in the case of vitamin E acetate, they're, they're gobbling up, they're trying to gobble up the vitamin E. Um, as you make your way, so you can see more of examples of, of these macrophages um, in, uh, in uh, panel, panel B. Uh, panel C, this is bronchial alveolar lavage fluid. So lavage is not a comfortable process. That means that they put a tube down your um, trachea, they get it into one of the primary <coughs> bronchi, and they literally flush it with saline, like they're gonna drown you, but they don't do the other side. And then they pull the fluid out, okay, to clean out the alveoli. And then now that they've got that fluid, they put it under a microscope, and now you've got, these are macrophages that are found in the lavage fluid. Okay, that's what panel C is. And then they can stain these with um, a marker to determine that they're actually in an activated state. And that's what this oil red O positive macrophage marker is on the bottom uh, right panel. So in these patients, you can see under CT, they look like they have pneumonia, right? They've got a massive inflammatory problem going on such to the point that they're losing lung function, and uh, they're in total lung failure in the worst case scenario, like with the 17 year old patient up in Detroit. And um, just to point out, this is normal lung histology. Look at how wide open and clean the alveoli are. And this is this evali lung from that one particular patient. There's a full on like island of cells in the alveolus that's not supposed to be there, okay? All right, so what do we know today these are data that came off of that website. Again, Thursday, you can click on uh, an update, but as of 11, 13, 19, we have 2,172 cases of e-cigarette or vaping product use associated lung injury, evali, that have been reported to the CDC. That's US numbers only. US numbers only, that's all the C CDC really focuses on. World Health Organization has additional data if you wanna dive into that. 42 deaths have been confirmed in 24 states. It appears that vitamin E acetate is the main issue. I think there are potentially others because there's investigations going on right now that there may be more than one cause of the ally. So is it safe if it doesn't contain THC or CPD? I, I would say no. I would say that there's too much information and there's too much data to demonstrate now that vaping or e-cigarettes are actually harmful to your health and they are not a safe alternative to traditional cigarette smoking. Okay? That's a long warning label to go on the box next, but they probably will have to have something come out. Questions? Okay, Nancy. Is there, so does that, I mean, it kind of insinuates what you stated that if they, if they find a new way to manufacture this without the vitamin E acetate, but then it's like safe, but then, you know, how are they gonna test that? Yeah. Are they gonna test it? They will be required to test it now, most likely. Right. So, yeah, I mean, the, the comment's a good one. If you're, let's, what's the polar side of the, the argument? The other side of the argument is free enterprise, right? Free enterprise in this country. So the, the manufacturers say, well, I mean, what if I switch out to some other cutting agent? What if they use saline, okay? 
they're still going to have to do tests to demonstrate its safetyness. Because now all this data is there. You guys with me? The other thing that's all over the CDC, and I want you guys to hear this, is um, they're, they're very, in the FDA website, there's huge warnings about buying e-cigarettes or vaping products from um, kind of sketchy operations. They don't say it that way, but you understand what I mean? Like you can go on, you can go on eBay, you can go on Craigslist, and you can buy stuff. Like I looked all this stuff up because I was trying to kind of reimburse myself in this space. Um, so there are mom and pop organizations that are just doing this stuff, and 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 they have no idea what they're doing. They have no idea what they're doing. And and you've got children that are using and consuming these products. That is a huge public safety issue. It's, it's a little bit different if, you know, a pharmaceutical manufacturer or a company that's under jurisdiction of the federal government decides to go into the business and make e-cigarettes and vaping. Is it, is it citizens' rights in this country to do this? Yeah, of course it is. But it's also the right to know if it's safe or if it's not safe. And that's kind of, that's the perspective that the CDC and the FDA are taking is we need the public to be aware of what's happening. So could they do new chemistry and figure out an alternative way to offer these products? I'm sure they can, okay? They're, they're not all bad people, right? And they're not all stupid. There are people that know what they're doing. Could they figure that out? Yeah. Are they gonna have to do testing to prove that it's safe? Absolutely. You guys with me? So that's kind of where the space is now. But you guys, presumably, if you're gonna be interacting with patients, you're gonna be seeing patients in your lifetime that have been wrestle that wrestle with this evaline, which is again a brand new pathology of lung disease that was just invented at least in the last five and a half years, as best as my records can can show. That's from a newspaper clipping, but you know, in an airplane club. But, but um, you know, that that's pretty good documentation. There's another question in the back. Okay. All right, we're gonna we're gonna pause there. Um, we're going to come back on Wednesday and we're going to start talking about